Hi, this is Mrs. Alexander, and this is your 513 front load isolating and identifying bacteria using the aseptic technique. We first need to go over the difference between a bacteria and a virus. The EOC w really would like you guys to know the difference between bacteria and virus when it comes to anatomy, being able to t tell the parts, and understand what they do when it comes to how to fight infections. Viruses versus bacteria. The first difference is viruses do not have cells in them, whereas a bacteria is actually a one-celled creature. It's considered a prokaryote. Viruses are in their own league. They're not considered prokaryotes. They're not considered eukaryotes. They're their own organism called a virus. You can't kill viruses with antibiotics. If you get a virus, like the common cold, you have to just let it run its course, and you will always have that virus in you. You can have keep yourself hydrated, get a lot of sleep, eat healthy, but once you get a virus, your body remembers it. Usually, further attacks from that virus aren't as bad, so the symptoms aren't as bad, or the symptoms can stay hidden or dormant in your body and come back up later. Uh, for example, chicken pox, you hear once you get the chicken pox, you can't get it again. Well, that chicken pox virus is the herpes virus, and it stays within you your whole life. Now, understand, herpes, you probably have heard of that before when it comes to like genital herpes. However, that's not the same as chicken pox. It's the same virus, but there's different simplexes. Cold sores, genital herpes, and chicken pox, they're all the same virus, but different simplexes, different uh, outcomes. So besides having the virus your whole life, you also need to know that they are way smaller than bacteria. Very, very tiny, which all has to do with what they can invade and how they can kind of sneak in our bodies. Bacteria, on the other hand, you can kill those off using antibiotics. Antibiotics have a variety of ways they work. They can go in and they can kill off the outer membrane of the bacteria or they can prevent the bacteria from reproducing. There's all sorts of amazing ways we've engineered antibiotics to kill off bacteria. However, bacteria, when you use antibiotics on them, antibiotics aren't really selective. So a lot of the times they'll go into your body and they'll kill off all the bacteria, even the good kind. The good kind that help us with digestion and help us do things like fight off different things that we may eat. Let's say you eat something that's kind of spoiled. Your intestines can kind of handle a little bit of that kind of food because of the bacteria that's in your stomach. All right, so let's take a look at a picture of bacteria versus a picture of a virus. This bacteria has some of the basic components of animal and plant cells. So you've learned about the difference between a cell membrane and a cell wall. Membranes are always on the inside, the closest to the genetic information. So in this case, number four, the plasma membrane is the membrane of the bacteria cell. Then we have the next layer out is the cell wall. Cell walls on plant cells are usually the outermost, but in the case of the bacteria, they have a third layer. This third layer is kind of like the capsule of a pill but in this case we call it a capsule or a capsid sometimes. So the bacteria is enclosed in this hard, hard outer layer. And that capsule will only remain for a certain period of time until that bacteria needs to break it down or use it for something. That's why bacteria can be very hard to kill because they not only have a membrane and a cell wall, but they now have a capsule. Be able to identify those three in order. Membrane inside, cell wall is the middle, uh, the next one, and then the capsule is on the outside. In addition to the three layers inside of the bacteria, there's no nucleus, but instead there's this big piece of DNA that's called a nucleoid. Kind of sounds like a nucleus, so hopefully it'll help you remember. That's the DNA without a nucleus. Now, pieces of the nucleus can break off and be used to reproduce themselves or go different places, and they'll call those little fragments a plasmid, number eight. Plasmids, you notice there's a couple more plasmids in here, but number eight points to one. It's just a piece of the nucleoid. And then, even though it doesn't have any other organelles, a bacteria still needs food. And so the ribosomes is how they synthesize their proteins for transcription, translation, and whatnot. Remember, ribosomes are protein factories. All right, let's talk about the outside of the bacteria. The outside of the bacteria usually has all these little wiggly things. The long ones are usually used for movement, so they can steer or propel the bacteria. We call those flagella or flagellum. That means tail-like. Then you have the little tiny ones that kind of wiggle around. They're, they're like the fingers. They help feel and sense things. And those are sometimes called cilia when you talk about them on an animal cell. But in this case for bacteria, they like to call them pili or pili. Kind of rhymes with cili or cilia. Or fimbrae. I like to think fimbrae like fingers. And so they're finger-like. They feel and sense things. They help find the bacteria find what they're looking for, be that a host or um, something to reproduce uh, or eat. 
that compared to back there are a couple different shapes of bacteria so what I just showed you look kind of like a pill or a rod the correct name for that rod shaped is bacillus if you look here it's the blue one picture it kind of looks like a pill there are other shapes of bacteria as well Coccus or coccus is spherical or circular like and then there's spirillium which looks like a spiral now if you take more than one of those bacteria and stick them together then we add a prefix in front of the word coccus or bacillus and then we get examples like diplococcus or diplobacilli or streptococcus staphylobacillus those kind of things you're going to need to be able to look under the microscope and tell me if a bacteria looks like circular, or spherical, rod-shaped, or spiral, and be able to use these terms to identify. That's later in the unit, though. That brings us to a virus. So a virus, I like to think of a little clone or robot that goes around and infects things. It kind of looks like a spider or machinery. And in the head of that virus is its a nucleic acid. Remember, there's two types of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Different types of viruses have one or the other, or sometimes both. Uh, viruses can affect all different things, and what viruses do is they go in and they inject their DNA that's in their head into some sort of cell. They make that cell become its slave or its zombie, and so it is, allows it to do whatever that virus's DNA is programmed to do. This can be really, really bad, especially in the cases of like HIV. HIV, we, we hear, you know, turns into AIDS. That is a virus that actually goes in and it targets T cells. T cells are our immunity. It helps us fight our infections. So when a virus goes in and takes over our immunity cells, it takes them over and tells them, don't fight any infections anymore. Make more of me. And when you're done making me, blow up and explode. That way you can't work anymore. Viruses are really, really bad. But um, we've tried to figure out a way to engineer viruses and make them do what we want. So there's this really cool field where we can actually go in and clean out the nucleic acid of a virus and put our own um, genetically engineered instructions in there. Those instructions might be for somebody to go in and make a certain um, amino acid or chemical that their body lacks. It could be like someone who's lactose intolerant. We could go in there and help try to change those cells to become tolerant to lactose or even to fight infections. And so understand that for every bad thing there is kind of in science, we're trying to find a, a good way to use it. Uh, specifically, we're trying to use viruses for pesticides. It's kind of a cool field. What I'd like you guys to do now is to pause the video and go ahead and watch these two Amoeba Sisters clips. The first one's four minutes long and explains bacteria. The second one is seven minutes long and explains viruses. Go ahead and press pause now and do that. Now on to the aseptic technique. Whenever we work with microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, those kind of things, it's very important that we use rules of the aseptic technique. The word aseptic refers to a procedure performed under sterile conditions. Well, then what is sterile? Aseptic means that we're doing something to prevent contaminants from getting introduced into your laboratory or your sample. Sterile is a word that we use to describe that an item has not been contaminated or it's been disinfected. Usually it's still in the original packaging and hasn't been opened yet. Here are some steps of the aseptic technique. Wear your gloves your other PPE, clean off your area, disinfect it before you use it. Some common disinfectants are a 95% ethanol alcohol spray or bleach. You need to do this before and after you're done. When you open up a tube full of bacteria, usually you hold your cap between your fingers. You never set the cap down. Doesn't matter if it's upright or down, you should never set that cap down. Uh, flaming. So to kill bacteria that may be on the lid or opening of that tube, it's called flaming the mouth. The mouth is the opening of the tube, and we're going to do this in class. So whenever I send around a sample of bacteria for you to um, collect some with an inoculation loop, that's a big, long plastic loop that you stick down into the bacteria to get some. kind of looks like a bubble wand, but it's really tiny. You have to flame the mouth of the tube so that no bacteria is on the top. And then making sure whenever you're ready to put bacteria into a Petri dish that you only open the lid of the Petri dish a little bit. Never set that lid down onto the table. I'm going to show you some proper ways to do that. Um, sometimes in a laboratory setting you won't use a disposable plastic loop, you'll use one that's metal. And if you use a metal loop then you have to disinfect it each time using heat, using the fire. So there's a way to do that as well. Uh, and then of course washing your hands and forearms is very important. Here's a picture that shows you the aseptic technique. I'd like you to pause here and watch that six minute uh, video showing you the aseptic technique or you can come back to it later in the presentation. Step one shows that you've opened the lid and you're holding it still. Now you're running the lid, the mouth of the tube through the flame. Step two, you're using the inoculation loop 
to get some sample. Step three, you're reflaming the loop before you put the cap back on. That ensures that no bacteria is now on the outside of the lid um, for future use. So that way when you're putting it in the fridge, the bacteria can't crawl off and get in your fridge. When you're done, you need to sterilize your loop to make sure all the bacteria is dead. So how do we grow bacteria in order to look at it or to look at what kind it is? We use something called an agar or agar plate, um, and that is used. It's a nutrient broth. It allows um, the bacteria to grow on it and to reproduce. And what they usually do is they streak it or they rub the bacteria on it in a certain way in order to be able to see individual colonies. Just like colonies in geography and world history, um, little areas where things grow, where people accumulate, same thing. There's little dots that grow on Petri dishes that allows you to um, see the colonies. I said Petri dish, and earlier I called it an auger dish. Petri dish is the plastic dish named after the guy that designed it. Auger is the nutrient kind of jello-like material that is in the dish. 37 degrees Celsius is body temperature. So most bacteria we're going to work with are bacteria that grow in our body, make us sick or help us keep from getting sick. And so after you have put your bacteria on your plate, you guys are going to store it in a little incubator, which is like a warm fridge, um, so that it stays at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. It's important to label plates. And whenever you label them, you need the name of the specimen or sample. Usually you use a capital letter, uh, abbreviated with the last name or the species name, uh, lowercase. In this case, it's K. rhizophilia. You also need your initials or name and the date that you put the sample on the plate. So that way we know if it's a new or old sample. So we'll practice doing this as well. And then very, very important, if you get asked this on a quiz or a test, when you're done, you want to flip the plate upside down. Usually put a couple pieces of tapes, the lid doesn't come off. Flip it upside down. And that ensures that all the condensation or the water droplets don't go into your sample and they actually drip to the lid instead. Here's an Im image that shows how we swab or streak plates to put bacteria on them. They call it the streaking method. And depending on what you're trying to look at, if you're trying to look at one individual colony or just trying to get a sample of the bacteria, you might do a lawn growth or a tea streak. You're going to do lawn growths this year. Um, in future years, you might do tea streaks. Um, but basically what you do is you rub the bacteria on the plate really gently with the loop back and forth. Um, if you're trying to get a sample that's colonized, you have to heat up that loop or throw that loop away and get a new loop each time. Instead of dipping into the bacteria each time, you just kind of streak through what you've already put on your plate. So a lot of times they'll divide the plate into three cross sections called for the tea streak. And uh, inoculate is the word you need to know. Inoculate means to put bacteria onto something. So you go to the doctor and they swab your throat for strep throat with a big, long, really annoying cotton swab. And they'll take your bacteria from your cotton swab and they'll go into the lab and they'll inoculate a plate of nutrient auger. And that nutrient auger will sit and then over a couple days they'll look and they'll look at your bacteria and see if it's strep throat or not. Pause the video here and watch the plate streaking method. So once you have that bacteria on the plate, you need to look at some things. You can look at the morphology, which is considered characteristics. Some characteristics are shape, margin, elevation, size, texture, appearance, pigmentation, and optical property. You can stain the bacteria and look at it under a microscope, and depending on what color it shows up, that's called gram staining or differential staining. And you can do different chemical tests on your bacteria and see what happens when you add chemicals. We'll get to do all those activities in this class, or at least look at some results. So let's go further into morphology or characteristics. The ones you're going to need to know for me are size, margin, elevation, color, and shape. So if it looks smooth when you look at it from the side versus wavy, it can be flat, raised, or convex. If it's large, it's bigger than a millimeter, the circle or the, the colony is. If it's small, then it's considered a half a millimeter or less in diameter. So elevation and margins and color. So color is, there's all sorts of colors of bacteria. Red, white, creamy, translucent, see-through. And then we talked about shape earlier in the presentation. If it's rod, sphere, or spiral. That shape you won't be able to see until you look at it under the microscope after you're done gram staining. The microbe library is a great resource that you can go to to look out and find more about each of the microbes. And then there's some awesome plate streaking techniques that I'd like you guys to go in and try on your own. Here is a... Um, Michigan State University's Virtual Interactive Bacterial Laboratory. Please go ahead and click on it and take some time and do this simulation. Uh, ask me in class if you have any questions.